Hi, Working Preachers. This is Caroline Lewis. Just wanted to remind you that the Working Preacher Fall Campaign is ending soon on October 31st. You still have time to make an impact for preachers around the globe. Go to workingpreacher.org to make your gift during the campaign, and your gift will be matched dollar for dollar. We need your help to continue providing resources to church leaders like you. Thank you for supporting this vital work. Don't forget to make your gift during the campaign to unlock a free ebook titled Digital Jazz. Digital Jazz is a workbook to help preachers apply media and technology appropriately to their proclamation of the gospel. Thank you for partnering with us in this ministry. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 30th, 2022, and we should say that there is a separate podcast for Reformation Sunday, but this is for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, come from Isaiah chapter 1, 10 through 18. The semi-continuous first reading is Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 and 2, 1 through 4. Psalm 32, 1 through 7, 2 Thessalonians 1, 1 to 4, and 11 to 12, and then Luke 19, 1 through 10, the story of Zacchaeus, and we all now want to break out into our little song that we know from our what Sunday song school days, Zacchaeus. He is was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore. We're Joy and I are trying to sing together, and it doesn't sound good. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Forgot. <laughs> yeah, but y'all know the song. So, anyway, great you might story. Not have been short. What's that? You might not have been short. Uh. It- the word, the word there could just mean you know, of diminished stature. It could be a, a social right. categorization. I know that ruins everybody's memories of Sunday school. <laughs> well, then we, yeah, what do you say a wee little man? You'd have to figure out a new lyrics for a How about a hated, scum, a hated scumbag would be it, another possible way of putting it. But. How are we going to rhyme that? That's, though? That I mean, doesn't that, go over very well in a children's <laughs> sermon, I don't think. Yeah, that's why they never asked me to do children's sermons. <laughs> Got it. Yep. All right. Very, very. Um, and you know, we're not at the end of the travel narrative, but we're getting pretty close. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so we're this last super close, super close. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, this this encounter then with. Zacchaeus, and I say that because this encounter with Zacchaeus, I mean, how is it then, how is it then become a summary, not, maybe not necessarily a summary, but you look back on all of Jesus' encounters with people throughout the gospel, and here's this one last one, and where do we see some of the themes that have been present in Luke and and really the way in which, for example, verse 10 could be a, a theological summary of the gospel of Luke and Jesus' ministry. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. And that, you know, that seeking out, going back to Jesus sermon and uh, in Nazareth and uh, the way in which the gospel begins and and the way in which lostness has been so much a part of this gospel. What does it mean to be lost? And then also then what does it mean to be found? And what does it feel like to be found? And what does it feel like to be seen uh, and regarded? So uh, that's one aspect of this of this story I think that you don't want to overlook. Is, is how much of Luke <laughs> and Luke's Jesus and Luke's, uh, Luke's interpretation of Jesus' ministry and why, and why he's here uh, is present in this passage. As a God who sees. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's, um, 
the story wouldn't work as well if it were not where it is here in Luke 19, I think. I, I think mm. it, re, it relies on uh, 19 chapters worth of characterization mm -hmm. <laughs> to mm -hmm. make you make assumptions as the story starts to unfold, right? So Zacchaeus is uh, introduced to us as a chief tax collector or literally a ruler, an arche uh, or archos and um, archon. Anyway, forgive my, uh, my declining, uh, uh, my declining attention span. No, uh, so he's introduced as a ruler, he's introduced as a tax collector and he's introduced as wealthy. All our characters we've seen before. We had a rich ruler in the previous chapter. We've seen tax collectors who have got shady reputations, but seem to find a home with Jesus. Uh, and the rich have not done so well in this gospel. Mm -hmm. So all the, already you're ready to, um, to, to characterize him and perhaps to judge him, to put him in categories. And mm -hmm. of course he breaks out of those categories or he overcomes those either because he has a genuine transformation or there's another school of thought out there, which is, he says, wait a minute, I've been giving away money all these years and everybody hates me, but nobody knows that I'm living according to kingdom principles. So mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. uh, read Joel Green's Luke commentary if you want a really good exploration of that, that point of view. But in either case, he breaks out of those, those boxes that I think Luke, by the way he introduces the character, almost wants to pull us into that trap. Mm -hmm. Right. Where we're like, this guy deserves to get a smackdown from Jesus. Right. Or this guy's got so far to go to reach the kingdom. And you have this moment of transition. I mean, he's he's kind of a queer character in that way uh, to mm -hmm. use that term for him. Right. He doesn't fit the norms, doesn't fit mm -hmm. the standards that we might have created for ourselves, but certainly that reflected in the society as the gospel recounts those. Mm -hmm. uh, and he might be showing us, you know, what it is possible to be possible to be a rich ruler tax collector. Uh, who's generous or who comes to Jesus. We're, we're not told he has to change his job. Nope. Mm -hmm. As offensive as that is, same thing happened in Luke 3 when tax collectors came to John. Right. He didn't say quit your job. He said be fair. So, I mean, there's all of these ways that he just, I just want him to be different. <laughs> yeah. I want some of aspects of him to be different. And I want him to either suffer more or to be more generous or something, something. Uh, and he doesn't because he's a son of Abraham and the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. So there's a way this passage would judges me at least and can judge a lot of us as readers who think, oh, it's Luke 19. We now know how this gospel thing works. We know who deserves it and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. We know who's attracted to Jesus and who's not. And this subverts that in so many ways. Yeah. And I think too, another, another background piece that is helpful for the preacher, how much you actually bring it into a sermon or not, but but to, but that phrase, this is, he is also a son of Abraham, uh, to go back to John the Baptist's, uh, speech in, in Luke three. And John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that is present here that uh, that bear fruit worthy <laughs> or that comes from a perspective of seeing the presence of God in Jesus. And mm -hmm. so how does that then, uh, how that has been a calling throughout Luke and the way in which, again, as you said, Matt, is it, is it a sort of repentance? I will give back or is it, has it been a habit? My habit is the giving back of, mm -hmm. uh, is it po both possible in the Greek translation, but, uh, the way, but the, the way in which this is cast in such a way of, of that bearing fruit. And is it, is it bearing fruit that comes from a place of being seen, uh, and, and, and recognizing, uh, recognizing God's presence here. So that's another, I think, important frame of reference for this passage too, especially as you think back on the entirety of Luke as we get you know, closer to uh, moving to year A. Mm -hmm. I'm on board with everything that you said, and it makes me want to lean into um, the Isaiah text. So uh, yeah. Um, because I think that this particular uh, text is uh, uh, can be a subversion 
of the way that we've always read Sodom and Gomorrah or the way some folks have tended to read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, here, um, first of all, clearly they were doing the practices of worship uh, that they were supposed to, that they were engaged in bringing the offerings, that they were offering uh, the sacrifices, that they were doing what were the festive festivities and festivals that they were to keep. And yet the problem that the prophet notes the problem that the prophet says is what makes God say, I don't want your sacrifices, is in verse 17. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. This is the very thing that in Luke, in, in the sermon that, that Jesus does at the beginning of his ministry, says what he has come to do. And this is where the prophet is calling Sodom and Gomorrah to account. And I think we're in the same places today where um, we there needs to be a recognition that it is not just going through the motions, which a week ago um, we talked a bit about the kinds of prayers uh, that are offered and what's an acceptable prayer. Well, what is the acceptable way of worshiping God? And it's not the right um, rituals. It's the ritual of extending hospitality. And man, that's a hard lesson. But it seems to me that that is still what God is calling for God's people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You get such peculiar rhetoric here to be addressing Sodom and Gomorrah for Isaiah, right? I mean, he's speaking right. through time. Uh, in doing that. It, but I, I, I do see the connections and I, I think you were getting at as well, but you know, simply what does it mean to be lost? <laughs> okay. uh, and how do you know when you're lost or when somebody is lost? Mm -hmm. Because things seem to be going well here. At least they're doing, they're doing all the religious stuff they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and what does it mean then to be saved or to be found as well? Because I think mm -hmm. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is finding might not be horrible sinner to now saint. It might be misunderstood, uh, right? Kind of abused by his society, something, you know, if only people saw me for who I really was, geez, that could be his. And in some ways the Isaiah one, I think the, the stakes are a little bit higher in what Isaiah is talking about, what about, is about to happen. But this idea that that, you know, hands that are full of blood might still be washed, mm -hmm. um, that there still might be, a, a, I almost said a use for these people, that's wrong. There still might be a place for these people in God's design, mm -hmm. in God's understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that either one is like the, the right answer, but just to explore that religious language of lost and found mm -hmm with the congregation and say, you know what, that might not be the same for everybody even here in this building, in this congregation, mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of how we're experiencing that. Mm -hmm. There's some common threads, of course, but. Mm -hmm. and just Did to, Matt yeah. just do a, a lean in between the Old Testament and the New Testament? I I'm can not do it every now and then. Anything, but I just, <laughs> no. if, I, if, I, if, I, if I jump in before you go, Caroline, to, to also, what does, the, the very act of what Jesus does with Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. Hospitality. Mm -hmm. That's what it means for us to care for the widows, the orphans, the, uh, those less fortunate, uh, to bring them up to experience justice and equity. Um, it's making sure that they have a seat at the table and that the banquet is spread. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I would only reiterate what, and just say it in a different way of what both of you have already said. I, I, I love verse 11. I, uh, the second part of verse 11, I have had enough. I am done with your <laughs> burnt offerings and your, your hypocrisy and your, you just name it. And the preacher can just go off on that and just say, I am done uh, with, with, and, uh, and it, that could be a hard word to hear because I think part of what churches are experiencing now 
uh, is the way in which how a reevaluation of our offerings mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and what our offerings have been, um, what what does church mean, and uh, and uh, and it's not to say that God is done with all of that, but it's it's it, it it's again making that connection between who do we believe God to be, and 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 how is it that we're acting that out? So it's a discernment moment. It's not saying. Stop giving the offerings clearly because the pastor needs a salary. But it's it it's not saying don't do that. But where are those gifts coming from? Where are those offerings of praise coming from? Where is that prayer coming from? Uh, and if there is no correlation or integration between who you believe God to be, who you believe Jesus to be, and those 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 that bearing of fruit, those offerings that you give, that table that you set there's the problem. That's, that's where God's like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm enough with you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think we're in a place of it's discernment not, on that. It's, it, it's, go ahead, Matt. No, I, you can go ahead. It's not Thank enough you. for us to have a beautiful facility that serves our people. What God is looking for is an extension that what happens in that beautiful building in that community has an impact outside the outside of the doors of that built sanctuary. Mm -hmm. That's where justice is lived out. And when the community, whether it is the immediate neighborhood um, or if that if that building has been built out in the suburbs, how do you come back to town? How do you come back um, if you've been in the city? How do you go back to the rural areas? Um, it, how is it that what you do on Sunday morning makes a difference in the lives of everyday people on the street, whether that's a road, uh, a rural road or an urban highway? This is half baked. <laughs> 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 Don't say that at the start of your sermon, but uh, this is half baked in my own mind. I wonder if what I'm thinking about is the flip side of some of what I think what you first brought up, Caroline. And the at the same time, I hear a lot of congregations being blamed for their quote unquote failure or for shrinking numbers. Mm. Yeah, as if their genuine acts of faithfulness aren't enough. Yeah, mm. right. I hear a lot of that in, and you certainly don't want you know, that. Not, not from you two. I hear that in the in right. the ether, right? Um, and so I would not want a preacher to to tell the faithful who they're on Sunday morning. You know, yeah. God doesn't like your religiosity, um, right. right? And maybe you're being punished for it because that's not what this text mm -hmm. is about. But I I do mm -hmm. hear that so much in the ether, and I'm I'm frankly tired of it. Um, mm -hmm. There are congregations out there that deserve a good kick in the butt, but there's also a lot that. Mm -hmm. are going through times of change that are not fault issues, mm -hmm. right? So. Exactly. Anyway, this isn't about the text. I'm just kind of wondering how this well, goes. This is, this, is, this, is, this is important, uh, Matt, um, mm -hmm. because it allows us to remind the preachers to prepare in with the mindset. Um, this is where preaching the text is important, not you know, becoming the prophet who, you know, shakes the finger at the congregation and says, you're ancient Israel and God is sick of you. Mm -hmm. But to step back and say, this is um, the journey that took Israel from being the promise, the representatives of the presence of God's peace to being put into exile because they weren't the, that representative. And then let the Holy, get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit convict the hearts. So what the preacher's task is to tell the episode. If you're going to do Isaiah, the, the preacher's task is to say, let's get a little bit of the ancient story of the people of God that is uh, on the midst of the journey of needing the Savior to enter into the world. As opposed to saying, you know what? It's time for me to be the prophet and I'm going to tell you how wrong you are. I, th I think that's a great challenge for us to think about if we're going to preach this text, Matt. Um, okay. it, uh, that may have been half-baked, but that it, it, can't, it came out pretty done. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. I don't know. And maybe the psalm, before we go to Habakkuk, maybe the psalm can help with that a little bit. It's... 
because it's part of this is having sort of a, a rhetorical sensitivity Mm -hmm. with regard to these themes, because you Mm -hmm. certainly don't want people to experience that kind of blame and shame, or as if, you know, the reason people aren't coming back to church is that they did church wrong. Uh, That's, and that's so, I absolutely agree with you, Matt, the way in which there's so much critique of, of how wrong church has been. Uh, And that's not it as it is, as it is, you know, a, a time for, discernment and maybe acknowledgement of, you know, I, I, I like verse five of the Psalm. Then I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, uh, that it, that it's a time of honesty or it's a time of, you know, a, a time of confession and a time of, um, but at the same time, a, a, a time for a deep trust in uh, in God and God's God's provision and God's presence. So, uh, and six yeah. and seven, verse six and seven promises that. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. I that, that again. That's 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 not even half baked. That's like quarter baked. But uh, <laughs> but maybe the psalm could be a little bit helpful in that. Mm-hmm. I'm just you know we are a we are a confessing people. Uh, That's about who we are. And there are times when that confession takes on different kinds of expressions Mm -hmm. and that, and that confessing itself is a, is a process of, of, yeah, it's a, it's an act of discernment. It's an act of decision-making. It's an act of, of, of reevaluation mm-hmm. uh, that um, that is necessary when any time you're in a relationship with anybody, including God. Exactly. <laughs> so that's what that's maybe how I would use the psalm in that regard. Sure. Yeah, I've said this a lot the last couple of weeks. This is another another thing the church can do. <laughs> Not just it will in the public square for one thing, or can model this to the world. And some of that is confession, forgiveness. Some of that is mm-hmm. truth. Some of it also is acknowledgement of those who have been sinned against. I mean, this is what Zacchaeus yeah. seems to be craving, perhaps, or there's something yeah. in that story. Right, where the whole story turns when Jesus sees him. Yeah, right. And and then people see him going to Zacchaeus' house, and everybody's like grumbling. You know, the, right. the church can help people pay better attention <laughs> mm-hmm. and recognize so that we can do that work of truth telling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that truth telling, if we kind of lean into uh, Habakkuk, is the uh, the in betweenness of the moment that we're in. So being honest, where we say to God, "Really, God, how long are you not listening?" Um, and then naming the circumstances that we're in, and then hearing the response, where the response is um, that the vision, the promise is the same, that God is faithful, it is not a lie, it will come, it will come to pass. Mm-hmm. And um, so there's there's a way in which even this text allows that to be expressed if we, if we pay attention to the in-betweenness of the moment that we're living in. Um, whether that is Zacchaeus who is trying to get high enough to get sight and so that he can be rightly seen or if it is us trying to figure out how are we genuinely extending the hospitality of God in the spheres of influence that we have. Mm-hmm. It, call, it, it calls for us to confess. It calls for, for us to cry out, God, how long? Mm-hmm. And it calls for us to believe the promise, even as it is not yet fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Second Thessalonians we have three weeks in a row. Uh, if you're, if you are preaching on this first Sunday after Pentecost and not Reformation, we've got this, and then two more Sundays of Second Thessalonians. Mm-hmm. If All if right. you feel called, if you feel in yeah. some ways, you know, led it led there. This one, you know, a lot of times we get verses one through four, then skip ahead to eleven to twelve. We see this a lot in the lectionary. 
this gap is a doozy. <laughs> so mm. if, if you've prepared a sermon on this, make sure your reader doesn't read five through 10 because people will have some questions that your sermon might not be addressing. But yeah, uh, it, it, it views the return of Christ as a time of, of the unleashing of vengeance and, and some retribution is going to happen. But mm. um but nevertheless, in these verses that have been assigned, so here's the one time we're not going to say, you should add verses. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it does talk about boasting and pride, and Stephen Fowler is helpful saying this is biblical language. This is partly what it meant to live in the first century and to know your place in society. And mm -hmm. uh, But the Bible has a lot to say about, about boasting in one's faith, boasting in one's standing before God, boasting in the faith of another. And some of that's upside down, like what happens in this in this passage where the author is boasting about those who are doing things that one would not want to, or experiencing things one would not want to boast about, like being persecuted. Mm -hmm. So it's, that'd be an interesting way in. If you, know, if you lose a bet and you've got to do Second Thessalonians for three weeks <laughs> during this time of year, then uh, I would talk about boasting and pride as spiritual virtues if done correctly. 